Well, good evening. Uh, absolutely delighted to welcome a uh, fellow Glaswegian to our SDN Insights programme and it's Fiona Donnelly over in Hong Kong. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you very much, Christine. Delighted to contribute. Thank you. Fiona, it'd be great if you could just give it, take a few moments and tell us your story and how Fiona has gone from Glasgow to Hong Kong. Basically, I am known as the world's worst backpacker. Um, I gave up my job as a CA with a big four firm in Glasgow in 1995 to travel. First stop, Hong Kong. I got here, I adored it, and I've stayed here ever since. Um, in the time that I've been here, I've transitioned from being an accountant to be a business development professional within uh, professional services. So I'm a B2B gal, but I'm kind of coming at it from an accounting wiring um, and now, as I say, a B2B person. So now I spend my time um, working in a few networks or just by myself. Um, helping companies with their business development strategy and its execution. So it's things like trying to help them understand the market opportunities, then help them with conversion, representation, engagement of strategic partners and such like. So yeah, so I work with um, some Scottish uh, contacts and I work with local contacts too. So keeps Wonderful, me thank you Fiona. Um, as I always ask Fiona, it's an opportunity to look out the window. I know mm -hmm. it's late evening now in Hong Kong, but looking out your window today or this evening, Fiona, what does it look like uh, compared to what it normally looks like? Well, it's, it's really interesting because um, Hong Kong, we sadly had went through SARS a number of years ago. So there is a kind of feeling a little bit of here we go again in Hong Kong. So when it really kicked off in Hong Kong on the 25th of January, Burns Day in fact, um, it, people were very quick to act and do things like wear masks. So uh, today if you could go out without one of these on you get a big scowl really kind of thing because it's just been a kind of accepted uh, socially better way to behave um, so rather than having fierce uh, shutdown and lockdown measures imposed um, the government have given firm guidance kind of thing so going around Hong Kong today um, you know there's coffee shops are open supermarkets are open a lot of things are open as usual and um, some things are shut things like um, uh, bars are shut restaurants are operating with them um, intermittent tables, you know, you can get taxis, you can get buses. You're just asked not to be in groups of more than four kind of thing. So it's very, very, feels very much like business as usual, but just a lot quieter. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're very delighted that these measures in the last uh, coming up, what, three months, um, now have worked incredibly well. And Hong Kong, despite having a population of about seven and a half million, we've only had four deaths, mm -hmm. which is just mm -hmm. remarkable. So um, yes, we're feeling very um, proud of ourselves and also now this week very happy because the government has said that um, where they will start relaxing some measures. So as I say, nothing's been hard mandated, but things like civil servants have been working from home. Civil servants will go back next week. Um, Hong Kong has taken a very firm line with schools and they shut the schools. Some schools will go back um, very shortly and that will help obviously with the exam situation. Um, so it's really, um, we feel, that we're on a kind of uptick, um, mm. baby steps, um, but it, you know we are now hopefully um, trending in a good way, uh, kind of thing. So that's good to hear, Fiona. And just when we were talking earlier about details about Hong Kong and how things are changing, you said to me an interesting story about one of your your clients and how they had um, are supporting their individuals going forward as regards home working. It's almost like could be the new norm, Fiona. Well, this is it. I think what, what we're, the situation here, and I think nobody really knows the answer, is that Hong Kong, as every other country or territory, has responded with its mix of measures. And so in a kind of very quick um, way, Hong Kong reacted and has behaved differently in the last three months. And I think now we're in this, the stage of, um, okay, now we're going to transition back to the new normal, whatever that means. But then it's also, well, what 
of these kind of fast put in place measures will remain versus what will be reversed back. So things like um, the, you know, friends in an investment bank, they've all been given a, a budget to spend uh, to equip themselves so that they have a fully functioning home office. So that obviously indicates that to some extent this kind of um, a measure during the epidemic will actually remain afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it really, you know, it will really depend on what companies do and how they do it going forward as well. So I think, you know, the whole um, change will come about in these two levels, I think, yeah. Yeah, and that comment about what companies do and how they will change going forward, Hong Kong in the Far East has always been a very attractive market for Scotland and the UK, long historic connections there. Yeah. Maybe that's what kept you there, Fiona, as well, many indeed. of the <laughs> previous traders have, well, have done. Um, well. But how do you see this new normal affecting and impacting in trade, and specifically between Scotland and Hong Kong? Well, I think as well, like the I mean, immediately it's going to be interesting to see on a sector by sector basis because the reality for Hong Kong as well is we've had another couple of massive macro factors uh, affecting the, the economy. Um, so, the, you know, we have come off the civil unrest of last year, which had a monumental impact on some of the same sectors that have been affected by the virus, namely, you know, hospitality, food and beverage, retail and passenger transport. Um, so these sectors are in agony these days, you know, um, among others, but they're the biggies and then the knock on effect to their supply chain. So I think it really depends on, on a sector by sector basis and what's going to happen. The other issue as well, that's the big kind of um, macro factor that kind of hit us sideways a bit, and we maybe don't even know it yet to the full extent, is the impact of the China-America trade deal yeah. and how Hong Kong will fail with that in terms of, you know, Hong Kong is a massive um, player and has a, it's a trade and um, logistics is a massive contributor to the Hong Kong economy. But how trade flows and trade functions will change as a result of all of these things, I think is really you know, open to question. Yeah, so a significant number of factors were already at play in the Hong Kong market Absolutely. before this uh, pandemic then hit it. Yeah. And, and that's the tragedy for people, um, you know, like retailers or whatever, you know, they're on their knees and loads of bars and restaurants have shut. Home hotels that would normally have 80% plus occupancy rates are, have been running at single digit figures. One of the airlines of Hong Kong is down to 3% of its capacity of its passenger capacity so the knock-on effect of that is just incredible in terms of people's propensity to spend money and commit to things and you know big ticket items luxury spends and you know so it's, it's just having a massive trickle down and i think the worry is um as i say that you know uh, although it's great news that uh, the as i say fingers crossed all being well we're going in the right direction with the epidemic and um, the concern is now with the civil unrest and um, while the wild sorry, the widely held view is that um, the protesters will come back with a vengeance because none of their, um, mm. well, only one out of their five requests have actually been addressed. And there's just still a kind of stalemate in terms of actually addressing their other points. So there's really no path to resolution there, which is to say will have a knock-on effect for some sectors more than others too. But that said, there's always winners as well. <laughs> Yes, uh, one of our winners. members in a, a, a session, in fact, when we had the, the Dubai insights, is never let a crisis let you miss an opportunity. And uh, it's, we're certainly seeing that in some markets and businesses well, visiting. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, whether the temporary pivot or the long term pivot, as you say, who knows, but I think that very um, phrase uh, is particularly relevant in, in Hong Kong and China because the, the Chinese character for crisis is actually a combination of the, the characters for danger and opportunity. So it's, it's absolutely kind of there in spades, uh, you know, to, to, to be held kind of thing and a reminder that, uh, yes, this might not be the 2020 that you thought you were going to have. However, how can you capitalise on the changes? Yeah. 
I would be remiss of me if I didn't pick up on one thing you said there about the luxury market, because we have a couple of our members in the luxury market end who already export into the Chinese and the Far East market. Is that a market that you feel will still hold going forward? Because it is a luxury, it is a different spend type, the economics of that market, uh, and Hong Kong is well known for its luxury malls. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so much of a B2C girl, um, and I think luxury tends to be in that kind of the yes. consumer side of things, but my observations for what they're worth, I think it's going to be fascinating because I think there's already, certainly, certainly in the short term, probably in the medium term and to some extent in the long term, people will be travelling less. So I think, yes. you know, there will be fewer holidays for sure. So does that mean that, you know, if people were going to Scotland to enjoy their salmon, the tartan, the, you know, whatever wonderful luxury items from Scotland, okay, they're not going to Scotland to buy it, but does that mean that they're actually still going to be wanting to buy the whiskey over in, in the mainland? I don't know. Um, there's also the there's a school of thought that thinks that you know this is going to be a bit of a wake up call to businesses, but it is also going to be a wake up call to how we buy, how we consume. So the whole thinking of are we going to be more conscious consumers, and are we going to kind of build build this back better? And it is kind of like, you know, are we going to scrutinise what we're consuming? Because now we can see the impact on, a, you know, the environment, for example. Um, but it's, you know, so you wonder, like, are we going to be taking the lesson from this and changing our ways? Or will we just default to what we've done before? There's been some really funny stories. And again, you know, what's that phrase? One swallow doesn't a summer make. But it's, you know, there was a story of um, one area, one province in the mainland, and um, people were allowed out of quarantine. Um, and what a, a one a famous French brand um, was the beneficiary of this behaviour because people went from quarantine to shopping to the point that they actually made 2.7 million US dollars in one day. So it's wow. kind of like, you know, so there's this thinking, I don't know if it's actually real for some or just notional or wish, you know, that we will be building back better and not just going back to the same. But then there's always going to be some that, you know, you know, this is this is what they're going to do and they're going to default to their old pattern. So, um, yeah. Behavioural economics is a whole podcast in its own, Fiona. Isn't it just? We'll isn't it that. just? Yes, yes. And I think overlaying the cultural filters of that as well, you know, because, um, you know, the, the rising middle class in the mainland, you know, they, they have a different set of behaviours and, you know, many other markets and stuff. So I yeah, just, yeah, yeah nice and times. Picking up on that cultural piece and a different way of doing business, we have all, uh, you know, globally moved on to this new technology. You and I are connecting in Zoom today, whereas before you and I would pick up the phone and, and have know. a blether. Um, so we've, we've all moved on to this Zoom technology or video technology. Uh -huh. From your appreciation of, of Hong Kong culture and doing business, Will that be a way of doing business going forward, Fiona? Or is it more a short to medium term fix? I wish I knew the answer to that question, to be honest. Because um, you're absolutely right. Culturally here, it's very much about relationship building and it's very much time in front of people and um, you know people want to actually you know go out for lunch or whatever people want to actually have miles on the clock with you to build up trust and actually get to know you and that's why it's a very difficult market I think to really succeed in optimally with a fly in fly out model that kind of thing and um, so I think yes you know meetings time spent together is definitely a kind of cultural norm but to what extent um, that will be removed you know and and um, replaced by this different thing and a different approach i think it could be you know different things for different people as well you know old school um, you know business people will maybe still default to the face-to-face -face and, and the younger generation will be more comfortable with um, this kind of interface but I think yeah hard to say what what I do know is um, having been here and you know uh, this situation being kind of 
foisted on us all. Um, things like we are so blessed in Hong Kong with such magnificent Wi-Fi and uh, telecoms, you know. So having the reliability and the coverage and the capacity just to everyone being, you know, launched using these platforms, it's been an absolute joy um, to, to, as I say, enjoy this um, infrastructural strength of the territory. Yeah. Yeah. And talking of infrastructure, Fiona, you were also sharing with me some quite significant infrastructure developments in, in the Bay areas in, in Hong Kong. Do you want to share a wee bit more detail about that and the opportunities that may come from that? Yeah, I mean, and I think this is, you know, it's an interesting point to remember because obviously the world has forevermore changed in some way or shape or form as I say what we do and how we do it but I think as well you know there's some things that will go on um, and you know in terms of the, their initiatives that might have a slight modification on, on how they will develop but there are plans that will crack on and they do present opportunities so one area or one topic that is very exciting for Hong Kong is this Greater Bay Area which is a, a jurisdiction um, in the south of China. So it encompasses um, Hong Kong, Macau, the former Portuguese yeah. enclave, and then I think it's seven provinces in the mainland. And altogether, it constitutes 71 million people. And it's got a GDP or combined GDP of 1.6 trillion US dollars. So it is a kind of punchy locale kind of mm. thing for sure um, and what they're trying to do is actually develop this as a kind of coherent whole and um, basically integrating the strengths of the different area both from a physical side of things as well as a service side of things to actually make a really fully functioning powerhouse kind of um, right. serving the world so just now you know um, many things are already underway for the GBA as they're calling it um, and things like the Hong Kong Macau Zhuhao Bridge is already open and this will fast track logistics um, and you know, movement of people between the, the areas um, but there's all sorts of opportunities across you know research ITC education engineering professional services because I think it's an area that's obviously going to scale up so there's a kind of opportunity yeah. by virtue of this now becoming a cohesive whole so there's a capacity opportunity but there's also just then gaps in that they will have in terms of you know in clean tech um, you know just areas that maybe we have got richer knowledge to bring to the table and work in collaboration on kind of thing yeah and if if scottish companies were wanting to find out more about that fiona and about that opportunity can they link in with yourself is there other places that we can get more information Absolutely. i think that's another thing i was you know i wanted to say today i think you know scottish companies are you know, there's an opportunity presented in Asia for sure. And I think given the kind of global shake up, you know, throw in Brexit as well for Scottish companies, I guess, you know, that's going to be a market changer over there as well. So looking at the relative attractiveness of the competitors, you know, of the different um, areas that you can sell in, it's kind of absolutely um you know, do your fact finding at home. There's so much information online. And then there's so many people like myself, but also through the Scottish Business Network and other networks um, overseas, yeah. that basically we can absolutely, in a heartbeat, signpost people to step one kind of thing. Um, and, you know, there's such a powerful network of um, chambers of commerce, uh, industry associations, even people like alumni networks, uh, Global Scots and all sorts. So there's a very easy way for, as I say, Scottish companies to be sitting in Glasgow, wherever, and actually really, really give it proper consideration. And then, you know, with our help, you know, actually work out what that means in terms of best next steps, you know. It's a continual theme in all these insights, Fiona. This is a time where it is about continuous intelligence gathering. Pick up the phone, organise a Zoom call, develop relationships in all these markets. People are busy, but they do have the time at the moment to start these conversations. I think so. And I think as well, there's a bit of a kind of solidarity in the whole thing, because I think there, you know, there's a few stars you know in the right 
sectors at the right time at this stage you know like if you are making masks for example if you are in cargo you know you're you're absolutely in you know a fantastic uh, market state however most organizations most businesses are in pain from this and i think there is an absolute solidarity of how do we actually make this all work together as an ecosystem kind of thing and i think it's interesting even like you know the big the big players who would normally you know, as, a, as another sort of wee example, but I think, you know, the big players who would normally throw their weight around about credit terms, for example, they're now realising that they've actually got a role to play in, in actually releasing liquidity to the smaller players and stuff. So I think, you know, come into these opportunities, understanding that, you know, the, the, the goalposts have moved and use that yeah. to your advantage. Yeah. Absolutely. Fiona, you, like, and I, you and I could talk, talk for ages um, <laughs> with all, all the insights that you have, but sadly going to have to draw this insights from Hong Kong to, to a close. Anything that you would like to share with uh, the Scottish trade community regarding um, Hong Kong and what happens next, Fiona? And I think Hong Kong trade and logistics is, is one of the it is the biggest pillar industry of Hong Kong. And so I think, you know, the whole concept of trading with international partners, it's, it's such a big part of Hong Kong's DNA. And even with these um, forces we've talked about, you know, it will still remain that. And I think it's just kind of for a Hong Konger to do business with a Scottish company is instantly comfortable because it trades with so many places around the world, you know, whether services or goods. So I think it's just, you know, you're, you're already dealing with a, a partner who has a propensity to do this. So I think come in wise, you know, if this is your first foray into Asia, come in wise, do your due diligence, get professional help, get the lawyers involved. You know, it is going to be quite familiar in Hong Kong, but equally very different. So I think just understand it's different and just, yeah, just take it in prudent uh, steps. Um, but don't be scared by the opportunity presented by it. I think it warrants careful consideration. Yeah, and all the agencies that you spoke about there are there to help and, and support, and including yourself there, Fiona. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's. I think the the you know the Scots offshore, as as many will know, are, are probably the most passionate version of Scots, to be honest. And there's nothing more we 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 like than getting a Scottish solution to a problem over here, if you like. So if we can make a Scottish victory over any other nationality, it's absolutely you know. And um, we would love to support that. So yes, please do get in touch. I love that. Get a Scottish solution to a problem. That, that's a yeah. great way to end, Fiona. <laughs> Thank you Brilliant. so much. <laughs> Lovely. Well, listen, Fiona. As always, stay safe. Um, I do hope that restrictions have been allowed in Hong Kong to help you and family and friends to move safely about in, in your beautiful city. So stay safe, and I look forward Thank to you. seeing you in the near future, Fiona. Take care. Indeed. Take good care of yourself. Thank you.